himself. I'm, I'm sure that you all know that. He has spent time in Bagram, also in Guantanamo. He was arrested originally in Pakistan. He had to leave Afghanistan when this country was attacked. As I was saying, Morrison was picked up in Pakistan. He was actually kidnapped in Pakistan. They kidnapped in the middle of the night, taken to Afghanistan. He was in prison in Afghanistan in Bagram Air Base. And um, from Bagram Air Base, he, like many other people, went on to, went on to Guantanamo Bay. Um, once he was released in 2005 from Guantanamo Bay, he, he got involved with the organization Cage Prisoners. He's been a tireless campaigner for Cage Prisoners ever since then. Ever since then. And um, without further ado, I would like to hand you over to Mohsen Beg. Jazakallah khair for waiting. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altuhu sahla wa anta taj'alu al-huzna idha shi'ta sahla. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, after you're all uh, fully pakorad and samosaed up, I think it's time to get back to the issues uh, regarding those of us who are suffering from the detention, from the extraordinary rendition, from the torture, from the dehumanization, from the degradation that we're seeing, and primarily that is of our sister, Afia Siddiqui. Faqallahu as-saraha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala release her soon. Afi Siddiqui has come to symbolize, symbolize everything that is wrong in the war on terror, but everything that is wrong with us as Muslims too. We can continue to blame Americans and blame the United Kingdom and blame the anti-terror policies and blame uh, everybody except ourselves. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us as we sit here, as we see people that have been butchered and massacred and imprisoned and tortured and so forth, that we are in our number, millions, and yet we are so useless. And it reminds you of course of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, Yushik al-Umam, an alaykum kama al akulu ila qasa'atiha. That he said that the nations will invite one another to come and eat and take from your lands as animals do from a plate. And the Sahaba replied by saying, Amin nahnu ya Rasulullah. Are we going to be few in number that day, O Rasulullah? And the Prophet said, La, is He said, No, you won't be few in number. Because to the Sahaba, this state of, of, of uh, oppression could only be envisaged if they were few in number. And he said, no, you will be like the filth of the flood water. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would throw into your hearts al-wahan. And the Sahaba said, what is wahan? Mal wahan ya Rasulullah. And he replied by saying, hubbu dunya wa karahiyat al maut Love of life and hatred of death. And what does that mean? Love of life and hatred of death. Pursuing the dunya. Pursuing worldly affairs. Pursuing those things that are not relative or relevant to your akhirah. And in doing so, you will not be able to perform what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects, expects of us. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَاتِ قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاتِ وَالْمُسْكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ You won't be able to do this. You won't be able to say that my prayer and my sacrifice and my life and my death are all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You won't be able to do this. 
And the reason why you won't be able to do this is because you have chased and adopted the way of the dunya. Because for us to gain any position of respect back in, the, in this world, we require some sacrifice. And we have seen the people who've made the sacrifice for this deen. I tell you, brothers and sisters, in the cells of Guantanamo Bay, and in the cells of Bagram, and in the cells of Abu Ghraib, where not just women have been brutalized and violated, even your brothers have been brutalized and violated in ways that I will leave to your imagination. You saw the pictures of Abu Ghraib, but those pictures came out a year, one entire year after Guantanamo and after Bagram, after we were taken into custody. They say, at present, that the Taliban is on the rise in Afghanistan. They say that to counter this, we have to send in not a few thousand troops, but tens of thousands of troops. Tens of thousands of troops. The United States has done this. Britain is pledging to send in hundreds, and they are putting the pressure on the other countries, the other European countries, the other countries in the coalition of the willing to increase troop movement in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, brothers and sisters, is the poorest country in Asia. When I was held in the cells there, I saw in Russian the word still written from the last superpower that occupied this poorest of nations. And yet, they want to increase the numbers of troops. And I'll tell you why. One of the reasons that they don't tell you why the Taliban or the resistance is on the rise. Picture this. A person who's got a beard, a person who wears the traditional shalwar qamis, a person who is a man of honor, a person who is respected in his community and his family, a person who fought the Soviets, a person who may have lost a leg or an arm or an eye during that battle against the Soviets. And he says, I don't complain about any of this except to Allah. A person like this perhaps is asleep in his house one day and a Cobra helicopter flies over his house or his village. After it decimates the entire village because they are told and given money by opposing tribes <coughs> that there are suspected Taliban here, the helicopters land, special forces go in. They start doing a mop-up, a clean-up job. Clean-up means the people that are there wounded try to take them and capture them, if not, perhaps kill them. Burst open the doors and drag out every male adult and take him into a helicopter, shackle his hands behind his back with plastic cuffs, shackle his legs. If he resists, kick him, punch him, spit at him, do what is necessary, threaten his wife, threaten his children. Take him, wounded or not, old or not, into this helicopter to the Bagram or Kandahar detention facility. And in this facility, on the way there, he's told that he's the scum of the earth. Not in English, of course, because he doesn't understand English. He's a villager, a farmer. But by people, the warlords and their allies, who are now the friends of the United States and the friends of the United Kingdom in Afghanistan. And then he's told that he will never see his family again. But that's just the beginning. Because then they take him into a process that even the Soviets, who are very, very brutal indeed, did not do. And what is it that they do to this man? Well, they don't really physically, physically beat him so badly. That's what the Soviets would have done. What they do to this man is they do something much worse to him because I said to you, he's a man of honor and a man of dignity. They throw him onto the floor, they take a knife, they slice that knife across his skin and he can feel that cold blade as it glides across his skin, cutting off his clothes. 
He struggles, but they push down upon him. There's two soldiers sitting on him, one on his head, with his knee onto his head, and the other pinning him down into the small of his back, so he's immobilized. This brave warrior, this brave mujahid perhaps, is now unable to stand up and defend himself. And he's humiliated, he's stripped, and he's taken into a circle of men, circle of men and women. You know, the American soldiers, of course, have equal opportunities, and that includes for both sexes. So they're both present, and they see him, naked as of the day he was born. But it's not even begun yet, because then they search his extremities. There's nothing to search. There's only humiliation to be had. And then they shave him. They shave his beard that he's never touched in his life, only clipped it. They shave his hair so that if he was to look in the mirror, he wouldn't know who he was looking at. He's never seen himself in this state, and yet these people have seen him in this state. And they photograph him, and they continue to photograph him. And then they laugh, and then they spit, and then they punch, and then they bring dogs. The American soldiers thinks he, think he's afraid of the dog, but he's not. How could he be afraid of the dog when he's not afraid of cannons and bullets and rockets and missiles? No, he's not afraid of the dog. He's afraid of Allah. He's afraid that the dog will make him filthy and dirty so that he can't perform his prayer. And of course, when they throw him into the cell, there is no water to make wudu. Not for an entire year, not for two years, not for three years is there enough water to make wudu. Only enough to drink. 500 milliliter bottle twice a day. You drink. If you don't want to drink, you want to use it for wudu, then you don't drink. Make your choice, which is going to be. Of course, the Prophet says, If you don't find water, then make tayammam. So this person makes tayammam for a year, two years maybe. Perhaps to the point that he does so much tayammam, he forgets that by the time they send him to Guantanamo and he does have water, how do you do wudu again? Is it the hands first? Is it the head? Which one is it? I'm talking to you, my brothers, about myself. <coughs> and things that I've witnessed about other people. They say to you that the Taliban is on the rise. But this Taliban, this Afghan, this Muslim, Eventually, he gets released. As you know, there are hundreds of people held in Guantanamo. And out of those hundreds, out of the 775 that were held there, 530 have been released. So when they said we were the most dangerous men on earth, why are we released? Why am I free? Why are 530 of us free? Not only are we dangerous men, we are the most dangerous men on the planet. How come? Is it any logic that the world's most powerful and arguably the most stupid man says that we are the worst of the worst and then he releases us? It doesn't make any sense. And yet, when these, amongst the people who are released, are some of these Afghan men, they go back home maybe three years later, maybe a few years later, in some cases a few months later, just to do justice. And not to say that everybody's held for month, for years on end. But then who does he go home to? Does he go home to a society that is like our society here in the UK or in America or the West? Where nobody cares about you? Where you have no family, where there is no extended family because every man is an island? And an Englishman's home is his castle? Is that what he goes back home to? Or does he go back home to his wife, to his children, to his brothers and cousins and his entire qabila? to his clan, to his tribe that makes up the nation that is called Afghanistan. And what does he tell this extended family, this clan, this tribe, this nation? What does he tell them? 